think you're muted still. Am I good? You're good. Oh, continue. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you for that introduction. Um, can you hear me? Can would you be able to chart over? Yeah, you can hear yeah, me. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm Anthony. Um, I'm a final year medical student. Um, I've got an interest in ENT as well as um, emergency and pre-hospital medicine. Uh, and uh, my experience for teaching ENT emergencies in this instance um, would probably mostly come from my um, student selected component. So I did two months in a major trauma center um, in a very large tertiary head and neck center in Merseyside. So you see a fair bit. So I'm gonna be covering ENT emergencies with you all this evening. And I'd just like to thank the LACES committee and society for inviting me to speak and you all for coming to, to listen. Let's see if my slides change. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so the learning objectives of this talk will be to cover some, the plan is to cover some common, well, reasonably common, but important emergencies in ENT. So this is relevant for people all the way up to, to finals and then to beyond, so junior doctors, because in most medical schools in the UK, at least, we sort of get less than a week in total of teaching on ENT. And then obviously when you're on surgical rotations as a junior doctor, you're expected to cover on calls in ENT. So you do have to cover a lot of this stuff and know it, even though you're almost never taught it. So hopefully this will like sort of demystify some of these conditions if there was any missed in the first place. So <clears throat> we'll start with Strider and yeah, ask any questions as we go. So I'm gonna change. So Strider is a high pitched monophonic sound and it's made from turbulent airflow in the airways when they're constricted. And it comes from the Latin creaking sound. I have to click. So the most, it's almost the most commonly described Strider is an inspiratory Strider. And it's when you have an obstruction at or above the level of the vocal cords. So if you know where your thyroid prominence is in your neck, at that level is where your vocal cords lie. So there or above is a strider, if you have obstruction. There's also an expiratory strider, which is when you get obstruction below the cords, and that's analogous with a wheeze. So that is actually a wheeze because you have constricted airways. It's usually the bronchioles. Um, and we're not as worried about that because obviously you've got a lot more divisions of the airways lower down. So it's not as worrying when they're obstructed when compared to one airway up here. <clears throat> and then you also have biphasic strider. And it's when you have a strider present on inspiration and expiration. And the easiest way I think of remembering or the way I remember a strider, the sound of strider is to think of like wind, windscreen wipers on a car when there's no water sprayed. So it's like, <laughs> that's my attempt of like, and it is one of those like things that just scares everyone. As soon as you hear that, you just, even if you don't know what it is, you know, you just, you feel worried. Um, so <clears throat> another way to divide this up into the points is between inspiratory, biphasic and expiratory is, or is where the, where the origin of the constriction lies. So if we think up here in the pharynx and the supraglottis, so imagine these are like the vocal cords. So if you're above that, most of the time, it, or at that level, it's gonna be an inspiratory strider. And it's because you breathe air in, the first thing you come across is that part. So you'll come in, it'll go through the mouth, into the upper airway, through the oropharynx, nasopharynx, down to the vocal cords. So that's why it's an inspiratory, because it's the first thing that comes across. And then expiratory striders down here, because you imagine your lungs are already expanded and you do big breaths out. The first thing you're squeezing against is down here, pushing up. And I hope you don't mind me going to a little bit of, um, of physics here. But <clears throat> if we think of these, these are my attempts at drawing. This is, so this is an airway and this is air, or you can imagine fluid, either work, going through this airway. Normally it's just air will flow nicely across here and there's linear pressure on the lateral, so against all of the walls of the airway. And then in this instance, say here, we've got an extramural compression. So this could be a tumor, it could be 
a hematoma, it could be anything external compressing on that airway, what happens is you get this turbulent flow because air still wants to come through at the same, at the same rate, which means it has to actually speed up. So you've got a narrower lumen here. So air speeds up to get through it. And <clears throat> I don't know if you, if you recall um, much physics, but when these oxygen molecules speed up, you actually have to, you're increasing their velocity. So you increase their kinetic energy. And if you remember Newton's first law of thermodynamics, it's that energy can't be created or destroyed, just transferred from one form to another. So in this instance, you have an increase in kinetic energy. So they have to, the oxygen molecules travel faster through here, which means you have to decrease some other kind of energy, um, which is potential energy. So pressure actually decreases here. So at the site, just distal, to this compression or this obstruction. So then what you have is you get this airway narrowing because if you see these arrows are smaller is how I've tried to draw it. And um, you have less pressure against the lateral walls just before the site of obstruction. So then you get this even greater, you get this collapse of the airways before that. So if you imagine if the obstruction was somewhere up here, then when, the, when you breathe the air in, obviously it speeds up here, but it all collapsed this, which is what creates the strider sound. And this is something called the Bernoulli, the Bernoulli principle. And it is also the same, the same principle that works for Venturi masks for COPD patients. So the lumen changes when you're driving the oxygen through and it entrains air in from the sides. So <clears throat> the way you approach a striderous patient is always the same as every emergency case is an A2E assessment. So you do your A2E assessment, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. So if you follow the resource council guidelines, doing your primary survey, this is what you'll do. You'll do your airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. And two important drugs to give in Strider, and nebulize the adrenaline because it helps to vasoconstrict the airway um, and to get the airway edema under control but it's not a permanent sticks. It's sort of a, a short-term short -term time saver. And then IV dexamethasone, which isn't commonly used, but ENT does use it. And it's a potent steroid that reduces airway swelling. <clears throat> if causes of obstruction or cause of any obstruction of any luminal structure it can be divided into three different types. So you could have obstruction outside the wall, so extramural. And these could be like tumors, abscesses, or hematomas in the neck. This is this hematoma bit's important because if you go, if you're brought to see a patient who's post um, a post neck op and it looks like they've got a large swelling and the swelling's expanding and the potential to have they might develop strider or there's potential that their airways become obstructed, they have certain stitches in that you can just pull out and you are supposed to do that. I know it seems scary and you'd think, oh, I shouldn't like the surgeon's obviously done these sutures for a reason they're made in a way that you can, the both ends are loose, that you can pull it and it comes off like a ladder. And that's to relieve a, any hematoma that might develop. So outside the wall is extramural, inside the wall is intramural. And that's sort of like tumors inside the wall or paralysis of the vocal cords, epiglottitis, um, things like that. And then things inside the lumen. So this can be foreign bodies, blood or secretions. There's just a few examples. <clears throat> And the management of Strider, so it is an emergency, so you need to do your A2E assessment. You need to call the anaesthetist early because they're the ones who are going to secure the airway. So they're, they're the, the, the person that you really want as soon as you hear, uh, you hear a Strider. And then you also want to call ENT as well. Um, in children, don't assess their airway. You don't even often get them to open their mouths or anything, do anything they don't want to do because it can cause them to go into laryngospasm. So the muscles all constrict. And then as soon as you've lost that airway, as soon as you've lost that larynx, it won't open again. So there's no way you're going to be able to tube them. And you might have to end up doing front and neck access in a small child, which is not, uh, not ideal. Then there's medical management we've talked about already. So dexamethasone, eight milligrams, three times a day. And nebulized adrenaline. So it's one mil, one in a thousand, which you'll notice is the same concentration as anaphylaxis because we are really worried about this airway. And it's made up to five mil. So you add four mil of normal saline. <clears throat> and at some point you do need to visualize the cords and that can either be with a, a flexible nasal endoscope, which I have a picture of later if you haven't seen one before. Um, and then emergency airway operations, you might want to intubate them, 
do jet ventilation, do a crag thyroidotomy, so that's the um, front and neck access, or a tracheostomy, which is usually in theatre under local anaesthetic. So that's Strider. I know that was a bit of a wishy-washy. These ones have a bit more, a few more images in. So hopefully they're a bit more um, entertaining maybe. So this is someone's mouth. So this is their oropharynx. Here's the tongue. Um, <clears throat> this is the hard palate. Um, so that's the maxilla bone and the palatine bone. There's the palatine tonsils here, which are the, ton the one we normally refer to as the tonsils. Here's the uvula. Um, I would ask a question, but I'm not sure if I get, if you, people want to type in responses, but can anyone tell me the, um, the reason why we have a uvula? And if no one wants to type in, I, I don't mind, um, just saying it in case we might end up being slow on time. Um, Chidora, could you tell me if anyone's wanting? Yeah. So someone said embryological remnant. Yeah, but it, it does have a function. For speech? No, not for speech. Gag reflex? Immune function? Um, so one of them, yeah, so one of them is, so it's not, um, it's not immune function because it's connective tissue. Um, it's, it's basically one of them is for the gag reflex. So you don't get any big, you don't swallow any large things. Um, so it's sort of to prevent that. And the other thing is to stop you from sending food or fluids up into your nasopharynx into your nose so that's the reason you have a uvula but what's important here in this image is to remember what this looks like this is normal and tonsillitis you'll get this big thing will hypertrophy this palatine tonsil on either side but you won't have any change in this anterior arch and that's important and we'll see why shortly um, but tonsillitis is typically known as acute inflammation of the palatine tonsils secondary to infection it's very common and it's not really an emergency um, as in GPs will normally deal with it unless the patient can't eat or drink, then, they, then they'll get admitted and they'll be seen by ENT. It's normally viral, so all the common viral causes, but if it's exudative, so if there's sort of like white lesions all around, white plaques, um, you should consider a group A beta hemolytic strep, so strep pyogenes usually, because that's the most common bacterial cause. Um, it is important to note, though, that as well as having this exudative one being a bacterial cause, it can also be caused by infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever, which is in like 90% of cases caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And that can also be exudative. But that's known as like a, um, it's sort of like a wash appearance. So it's like you'd have white sort of all over the tonsils and you'd have bilateral tonsillar enlargement. But with um, regular tonsillitis bacterially caused, you'll have sort of patches, which you'll see shortly. Symptoms are things like fever, sore throat. Trismus is when you, someone can't open their mouth properly. Um, and it's obviously just because you, you, you've obviously got this really tight, these tight tonsils, it just makes you it's difficult to open your mouth. Um, dysphagia, so difficulty swallowing and malaise. Um, some of the signs, that you'll see are enlarged and inflamed tonsils and um, white exudates on the tonsils and lymphadenopathy. And this is important, the lymphadenopathy, because it will help us distinguish between infectious mononucleosis and bacterial tonsillitis. So if we see this is the anterior cervical chain, this is usually what would be inflamed in tonsillitis. So this is actually, if you've traced this, this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle that goes from just behind the ear, so the postericular space, down to the, to the angle of the sternum, so the sternum with a clavicle joining. So that, um, that's here. And you have the superficial and then the deep anterior um, cervical chain. Superficial is on top of the sternocleidomastoid. Deep is below it. And the reason this is, this gets inflamed because... Oh, because the palatine tonsils drain into here. So they drain into the deep anterior, which is why these are inflamed, but you don't get posterior enlargement. Whereas in glandular fever, you can have both. And that's very commonly seen in both. So if you're able to see a patient and you're not sure which it is, oftentimes if they've got posterior lymph node enlargement, 
um, cervical lymph node enlargement, then it's more likely going to be glandular fever. And then there's the Centaur criteria. So this is a set of four criteria that's used in the UK. I'm not sure if it's used elsewhere um, to sort of decide how likely it is that someone's got a bacterial infection or a viral infection. So if there's exudate, if they have tender anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, a history of fever over 38 degrees Celsius and absence of cough, the more you have, the more likely it is that this is a bacterial cause and see how this has tender anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. Because obviously if it's, if you look at this image and you think someone has glandular fever, they have a pharyngitis as well, which means they have the whole of the oropharynx will be affected, which means all of the drainage is sort of affected. So all of your lymph nodes can be enlarged, which is why this, this criteria specifies anterior for bacterial because it's only limited to the palatine tonsils. And then usually you'd prescribe phenoxymethyl penicillin, which we'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> so this is tonsillitis. This is a picture of tonsillitis. So this is the uvula. It's not really deviated because here's the midline of the tongue. But you have these swollen tonsils on both sides. If you look here, this would come out. These are both, and here's the exudate, this patchy exudate. So this does look like it would be um, either a glandular fever or a bacterial tonsillitis. But if we look, the anterior arch is still in place. It's not displaced medially. So the management for tonsillitis, you do your blood test, you do your FBC, your CIP, so your infection markers, your um, inflammation markers, your LFTs, a glandular fever screen, which is a monospot test or the Paul Bunnell test. Um, the reason you do LFTs here is because glandular fever can actually raise your AST and ALT to two to three times normal for up to normally about 20 days. So that can be another telling sign. But you only do this glandular fever screen in the second week of the illness, because in 25% of cases, patients who are, are, have been shown to be positive for glandular fever have actually had um, false negatives in the first week, which is why normally you do it in the second week of illness, because that, that um, lowers massively. Um, if the symptoms are severe, so they've got dysphagia and, and the fevers, then you consider giving them sort of IV treatment. So this would be fluids, antibiotics, not amoxicillin. Does anyone know why we don't give amoxicillin or try to avoid it? Causes a rash with mm -hmm. mononucleosis. Yeah, exactly. So in 90% of pa patients with infectious mononucleosis, they actually get a macular rash with amoxicillin that looks like an urticaria or rash of um, an anaphylactoid reaction. So then you imagine they're allergic to this and then they never get amoxicillin again, which isn't obviously isn't good antibiotic stewardship. So we avoid that if we can. Um, IV steroids in severe cases and we reassess them within 12 to 24 hours. <clears throat> they also have, we also have to warn them that if they've, if they've got glandular fever, they can't play any contact sports or drink alcohol for three months. And that's because you get this um, lymphocytosis. So you get more than 50%, usually more than 50% of your white cells are lymphocytes. And they're obviously taken out in the spleen and they sort of like live from when they're recycled, it's through the spleen, that they cause a splenomegaly. So there was a study done recently that showed that in patients who had glandular fever, they had ultrasound scans of their abdomen every week. And it showed that in as a mean, so on average, the spleens in patients with glandular fever were 33.6% larger than they, they'd started originally. And this sort of goes to a maximum of 12 days. So they get to that 33% about 12 days and then four to six weeks after the spleen's back to normal. But in that time, you're worried about um, splenic rupture. It only happens in 1% of patients. So it's not likely, but it's, it has been shown to happen before. So Obviously, we tell patients to avoid any contact sports and alcohol. So Quincy. So we've gone on from tonsillitis to this is the, the worrying one from tonsillitis. This is a Quincy. So it's also known as a peritonsillar abscess, and it's a collection of pus in the peritonsillar space. So if we look here, all of this is pus, and it's always from a bacterial cause. And if you look here, you can, I don't know if you can tell, but the anterior arch is actually pulled over. So this is mainly the anterior arch and it's pulled over. So when the anterior arch is moved immediately, 
you're more worried. And then obviously the uvula is displaced. Here's another example. So the anterior arch is more medial. <clears throat> it's commonly a um, complication of bacterial tonsillitis. So group A, B, hemolytic strep, or Haemophilus influenzae. Um, and the signs and symptoms, so you get trismus, so difficulty opening the mouth, hot potato voice, because obviously you've got massive swelling in your mouth, and your tongue and your, your lips and the way you move your mouth is very important for phonation, and you're not able to do that, so obviously you're going to have a change in voice. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis on the most part, but you can do an ultra intra or ultrasound to diagnose if so, if you see fit. And it needs an urgent ENT review because they need aspiration or drainage. Like it needs to come out because it can lead to deep, deep neck space abscesses. Um, and normally this isn't done under general, this is done under local anesthetic. So you'll anesthetize the mouth and you'll either put a needle in and drain whatever the 10, 15, 20 mils in there, or you'll just get a, get a knife and drain it and then use forceps to make sure it's cleared out. And then you'll give them IV antibiotics and IV steroids. And yeah, you want to worry, you're worried about this because it can extend into the retropharyngeal space and lead to a deep neck abscess. Okay, so that's, um, <clears throat> that's Strider, tonsillitis and Quincy. So this is a Titus media. How are we doing for time? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so acute Titus media is when you have inflammation in the middle ear and it's usually due to infection. This is a normal ear. Um, does anyone want to tell me which ear we're looking at here? So we see we've got the handle of the malleus here going around. You can see the incus in the background. This is the cone of light and there's no obvious retraction anywhere, which is a good sign. It looks healthy, normal color. So Anyone? So people are saying the right ear. Yeah, yeah, they're right. So you can tell by the direction of the, of the malleus. So if it goes up like this and then the cone of light always faces forwards in a healthy um, tympanic membrane. So now we'll see a not healthy tympanic membrane. <clears throat> so 90% of children have an episode by the age of two. And if we look here, this is a big bulging red tympanic membrane where you can't obviously make out the cone of light. You can't make out a lot of the structures other than the handle of the malleus. And then there's likely to be pus behind here, which is sort of pushing the, pushing the tympanic membrane out towards us. It's usually viral in most cases, and it tracks from the pharynx. So the eustachian tube that's in the nasopharynx then goes into the middle ear. Um, and it's more common in children because the tube's shorter, wider, and more horizontal. And the cause of organisms is, I normally find this, I remembered finding this easy to, easy to remember um, back when I had exams, because if you think the cause of the bacterial causes, Haemophilus influenzae, um, influenza, I don't know what I'm saying, strep pneumonia, and Moraxella catarralis, those are all the same three most common bacterial causes of infective exacerbation COPD. And it makes sense because if you think these are respiratory pathogens, they're coming in the respiratory tract into obviously affecting the lungs, but they will also go into the middle ear that way. So that's sort of like um, two birds, one stone. Viral, so RSV, rhinovirus, adenovirus. Presentation, I'm sure you all know all this stuff because it's a very common thing to see. Atalgia, fever, deafness, bulging red tympanic membrane, um, and purulent discharge. So that happens when the tympanic membrane perforates. So you have all this. What happens usually is, say, if you'll get a, like, for example, it's the eustachian tube might collapse for whatever reason. You don't have the air equalizing pressure in from the outside environment to the middle ear. So pressure decreases in the middle ear, which sort of draws fluid out from the cells. And then you have the buildup of fluid as well as these, these pathogens um, sort of growing there till eventually you have so much pressure there from this fluid that it bursts the tympanic membrane. And normally like it will relieve the pain of the patient, but then they'll have this discharge. Um, <clears throat> diagnosis is clinical. Management is um, sort of analgesia usually. So it's just paracetamol, ibuprofen, um, making sure they're drinking enough. Um, and then antibiotics if it's really not getting better. And then surgery is sort of like a last resort in this patient. You admit patients with a tightest media. Well, the nice um, guidance in the UK is that if they've got a severe systemic infection, so you're worried about sepsis there, um, if they've got acute complications of it, so meningitis, mastoiditis, and abscess, and children un young younger than three months, if they've got a temperature of 38 or more, 
and you consider admitting them if they're younger than three months and they've got temperature of 39 between three and six months. These are many of the things that are complications of acute otitis media. But next, we're going to look at this one, so mastoiditis. So this is a potentially life-threatening infection of the mastoid air cells. The symptoms and then signs are sort of pain, swelling, erythema behind the affected ear. You get protrusion of the pinna as well, so the back of the ear, because obviously you have this abscess pushing forward and systemic upset. This is what it looks like. You want to assess the patient for sepsis and intracranial spread. So they might have sort of like meningitis or intracranial abscesses. Um, they, they be, this is how they're treated with IV analgesia, fluids and antibiotics. And you want to keep them nil by mouth because they might need a mastoidectomy. So they might need a surgery. Um, and then you do a CT of the temporal bones. It is often a clinical diagnosis, but you do often see if they're going to have an operation that the surgeons like to see them having um, imaging beforehand and they may require a cortical mastoidectomy and one good clinical tip is that if you can feel the mastoid bone it's probably not mastoiditis because mastoiditis is an abscess of the mastoid air cells so actually you'd feel a red swelling and it's like normally fluctuant and bulging and if we look here this is an axial ct of someone's head so here's the nasal septum here's some conchi and here's the maxillary sinuses. And then if we move back, these are the external layers. And this is the maxillary, um, the mastoid air cell, sorry, and on both sides. And if we look here, so bones are white and air, the uh, bones are white, air is black. So air is black here, which is normal. So we've got air in the mastoid air cells, which makes sense. But over this side, we've got fluid here and we've got, a, it's a darker color. So this is showing mastoiditis on a CT. That's what that looks like. Um, epistaxis. So we'll have a break after epistaxis. I know we're speeding through here and I'm sorry if I'm going a bit quick. So actually we'll start with, so for epistaxis, um, so the nose is very vascular. It's a very vascular organ. Um, can anyone tell me why it's very vascular? Any thoughts in the chat? People are saying warming air, humidifying mm. air. Yeah, so it, it's to warm and humidify air because obviously that that sort of eases the load on the lungs and on the alveoli. When air is brought in, so it's entrained through the nose, it's heated up and it's humidified. So it's given some like water molecules. Um, so it makes less resistance on the way down. And that's why generally you're supposed to breathe through your nose as opposed to your mouth. It's better for you. So if someone comes into your department um, with nosebleeds, so epistaxis, you do your A to E assessment, just like all of these things, um, to make sure your patient's safe, first of all. You'll sit them upright, because um, obviously gravity, you don't want them going back, because then they'll bleed backwards and can bleed into their throat, into their esophagus. And blood's an emetic, so blood will make them want to vomit and feel really nauseous. So you don't want to be sending it back down into the stomach or anywhere like that. Um, and you put pressure over the cartilaginous part of the nose. So this is sort of where <clears throat> um, some people, you get a lot of people telling you different things, but there's right and wrong, wrong, wrong ways to deal with epistaxis. And this is one of the important things. So here, this, these are the cartilaginous parts of the nose and these are the nasal bones. So this top bit here, you'll get a feel on yourself. These are bones here. And then the rest of this is cartilage. So you don't press up here because it's bone. So you can't compress, you won't get anywhere doing that but you can press down here because it's over the cartilage so that's squishy and actually this part is little's area so it's kesselbax plexus which is where a load of these arteries um anastomose and this is the most common site of epistaxis so actually by pressing over this cartilage's part you do the best chance of um tamponade in that that bleed and here's an image so you don't do this and you do do that and you get them to lean forward and they're doing it. <clears throat> Next thing is they'll do that for like 15 to 20 minutes and hopefully it will have um, stemmed the, it will have stopped the bleeding. And then if not, you want to suction. So you get your suction out and remove all the clots and whatever you can see in the nose to get a, a good visualization of it. And then you use your thudicum nasal speculum to, to inspect. So that's what they look like and that's someone using them. 
an interesting image, but um, <laughs> this is how you use it. And that's to get a good view in the nares. So you can see if you can find the site of bleeding. And if they're still bleeding, what do you do next? <clears throat> so this is where we need to understand our anatomy a little bit. So the most common site, which we've said already, is Kieselbach's plexus. So in 80% of cases, people will bleed if they've got a nosebleed from whatever cause. So it could be idiopathic. It could be iatrogenic from surgery, for example. It could be even drug use, such as cocaine, or even temperature, or um, plate-like antiplatelet use, like stuff like that, anticoagulant use. Um, 80% of cases, it's in this area here. And there's an anastomosis between the anterior and posterior ethmoidals, the superior labial and the greater palatine. And what you'll have normally is an, an anterior bleed, is, is a bleed on the septum. So you'll get a unilateral, you'll get unilateral bleeding. And then if you have a posterior bleed, which is in Woodruff, Woodruff's plexus, um, you normally would have bilateral bleeding and then bleeding in the, in the, in the mouth, so the oropharynx. And that's, and then we go through a few, oh, I can't really see this, but okay. So the internal carotid, let me see that, supplies the ophthalmic artery, which then supplies the anterior and posterior ethmoidals. And the external carotid, so you have both your carotids involved here, supplies the maxillary, which supplies the sphenopalatine, the great palatine, and then the facial supplies the superior labial. So that's just some anatomy to know. Um, and then treatment. So if none of that stuff's worked, then the next thing you can do is you can get like cotton wool balls and put adrenaline and lidocaine on it to cause vasoconstriction and put it in the nose for a little bit and see if that works. If not, you want to try and chemically cauterize. So this is, these are silver nitrate sticks. So what you do is like here, you've got a bleeding point and you just put them in and on contact with skin, they, um, they cauterize, so they'll chemically burn the skin and hopefully stop the bleeding. If that doesn't work, you can do a thing called anterior packing. So this is to pack the front of the nose. So this is a rapid rhino. So it's made of this like hydroxycolloid compound that when you put it in the nose, and notice how he's putting it horizontally, because some people will think you go it up layer like that, but that's not how the, how the floor of the nose lies. It's actually along here and down. So you put it in like that, it's very painful, um, but you put it in and then you fill it up with air and it expands and then hopefully tamponades the bleed. And then it's got, because of the hydroxycolloid compound in it, it's, it's meant to stop um, the removal of new clots when you take it out, which is meant to be a good thing. The other thing you can do is get like petroleum soaked gauze and you layer it in, so you push it in all the way to the back and sort of leave it like that. And that's been a practice for years. So Hippocrates actually in like 400 BC, used to use sheep's wool um, to pack boxers' noses when they had nosebleeds. So we really haven't come that far, to be fair. Not much has changed. Um, and this is a urinary catheter. So this is a Foley catheter. And you're probably wondering why this is here. But this is for a posterior bleed. So these are to try and treat the most common, the anterior bleeds. If you have a posterior bleed in, in Woodruff's plexus back here, what you can do is you can insert a Foley catheter and you watch the tip go past the nasopharynx into the oropharynx and you look through the mouth and you can see that tip then you inflate the balloon and pull it back and um, so that's to sort of cause pressure there and hopefully tamponade the bleed what you also have to do in that time is use an umbilical clamp and a bit of gauze in between it to keep it in place because otherwise it can go down and block your airway um, but the reason you do this and you have to change this within a day or two is because you can cause ala necrosis so the cartilage at the front of your nose here can actually accrues and it's um not a good look so um that's something we, we often worry about and here's what they look like so this is a foley catheter and this is a rapid rhino so going in and being blown up and then just an algorithm that i found which was actually quite good is if we just follow all the, the ways we've learned now to stem a bleed um you do your atls so abcd approach simple first aid so pressure on the soft part of the nose head tilted forward then you have a look inside um, with your thudicum and see, you might have a head torch on as well. Silver nitrate, if you can find this, the source of the bleeding. And if you've got hemostasis, you discharge them with naseptin cream for two weeks. So that's sort of an antibiotic cream, but it does contain arachnis oil, so peanut oils. So if someone's allergic to peanut or soya, don't give them that. And then you do an anterior nasal packing. So that's like the rapid rhinos and the gauze. And if that works, you remove the pack after 24 hours because it can lead to like toxic shock syndrome. So the same as when you 
someone has a tam uh, tampon in for too long. And if it's in for more than a few days, you give them antibiotics to prevent that. And then if you don't get hemostasis, you do the posterior packs or like catheter or whatever and consider surgery. So this is the interesting aside, or at least I hope you find it interesting. Um, <clears throat> so the endolymph <clears throat> is the fluid that's in your cochlea. And it's the thing that converts the mechanical energy of the transfer when you um, from your bones of hearing into 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 chemical energy and then into electrical energy down the cochlear nerve, and they this endolymph is produced in the stria vascularis, which is here in the cochlea, and that requires melanocytes, so the skin cells that give pigment. And so pigment disorders like albinism are associated with deafness and you get in Dalmatian dogs, cause they've got all of these um, albino patches. They're actually hard of hearing. So 30% of them of Dalmatian dogs have some form of um, some form of hearing loss, either unilaterally or bilaterally because they aren't able to produce um, endolymph as much as they should do because they haven't got the melanocytes to do it. Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, Chidora, do you want to, if there's any questions or anything, do you want to hear him? Because we've, no, we've not got much more to go, to be fair. Yeah, so there were <coughs> I wrote down earlier, if anyone has any more, just put them in the chat and I'll get them too. <clears throat> but someone's asked, could you go over which conditions have anterior cervical lymphadenopathy and how does glandular fever present in terms of lymphadenopathy, please? Mm. Yeah, so the anterior one, if you think about it, anterior is usually, it would just be a tonsillitis. So if it's a pure tonsillitis, you'd only have, you'd affect your anterior, um, your anterior cervical chain, cervical chain, sorry, cervix is completely different. Um, but basically what I was saying is because it's because of that site in the palatine tonsils, they drain into the anterior compartment. So they drain into there, into the jugular digastric and the, um, anterior deep, um, cervical chain. Whereas in the rest of the, it's called Valdea's ring, which is the rest of the tonsils. Um, they all have different drainage sites. So if you have pharyngitis, so you've got the whole of the pharynx affected, You'll affect, you'll affect more sites. So you'll have lymph drainage um, occurring. Well, lymph drainage occurs anyway, but you'll have uh, lymphadenopathy in more than just that anterior chain. So glandular fever <clears throat> is the example where you'll have, you get the lymphadenopathy in the anterior chain, but you also get it in the posterior chain because you have your other tonsils um, or your other lymphoid tissue further back that's affected. So when that's affected and that's inflamed, you get the lymphadenopathy in the other side. So in this case, it would be posterior. So the only one really of note is to say that glandular fever, you'll get it more commonly posteriorly. And then in, um, in bacterial tonsillitis, you'll get it more commonly anteriorly. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. People are saying thank you. Okay. So another one was, is there a high occurrence of splenomegaly from glandular fever related tonsillitis in pediatric patients? Oh, good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say yes to that because in, in all patients who have glandular fever, in nearly all cases, there is an element of splenomegaly. So it wouldn't change with children or adults that if you have glandular fever at the time you have glandular fever because of the lymphocytosis, you're going to have splenomegaly in some form and you often get hepatomegaly as well. So you get liver enlargement as well. So yeah, it does happen. It will happen in kids as well. Fab. Thank you. Sorry. Right. So someone else asked, does telepressin work in epistaxis? Um, it's not commonly used in epistaxis. I couldn't tell you exactly why it isn't, it isn't always used, but no, it's not something that's in any guidance. So it's not, um, I don't know if there's any, actually been any research on whether it's effective in epistaxis because there has recently been research on whether TXA, tranexamic acid is useful, which has been shown to be um, to stem bleeding, but terlepressin, I mean, it makes sense, 
cause vasoconstriction, but there's no there's no evidence that I've read um, regarding epistaxis with terlipressin, but it would make sense. And then the last one that I can see, yep. can you go back to the otitis media complications? Oh uh, yeah, um, I'll do that at the end. I'll go back quickly there. Yeah, that's probably better. Um, and I'll give the slides out anyway, so if you want, that might be yeah. um, easier. Another one's just come up. I don't know if you want to do yeah, this go on. at the end, but can this you- This is the last topic anyway, so oh, then a few questions. Um, they said, can you discuss epiglottitis red flags, please? Yeah. <clears throat> so the interesting thing with epiglottitis is you always have to consider it because obviously epiglottitis is just inflammation of the epiglottis. And that's the one where it's, you'll find a young child who has this potato speech. They're not really able to like the hot potato speech. They're not really able to speak properly. And they might be <clears throat> like leaned over and they're struggling to breathe and they they have strider. And in that patient, regardless of whether it's epiglottitis or not, you have to consider it that it is. You have to worry that it is and always get an anesthetist and never inspect the airway yourself. But to a, a sort of counter to that is since the Hib vaccine was introduced in the UK, it was introduced in 1992. Since it was introduced here, the occurrence of epiglottitis is like exceedingly rare. So actually the most common cause of like stridor um in patients nowadays, like acute stridor, is croup, so laryngotracheal bronchitis, which is caused by a parainfluenza virus. Um, but there's not many cases of um, epiglottitis at all. But it is something you have to worry about, and it's all the same things. So as I said, it's like the hot potato speech, and they've got stridor, and they're just they're struggling to breathe, and they might be bent over and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's all. So, so this is the last topic and then we've got some questions. So I think we've got time. So foreign bodies. So foreign bodies are an extremely common emergency presentation to ENT. So the sites you normally get them are just anywhere there's an orifice really. So um, your external auditory canal, your nasal cavity and your airway. And then your esophagus, obviously. So I think this is a cockroach, but I'm not quite sure. But that's in somebody's ear. Um, it's often seen in young children because they just stuff things everywhere. People with learning difficulties and patients with psychiatric conditions. Also in the elderly and people with esophageal disorders. So that's normally like food boluses. Um, it needs to be removed immediately. If in the ear or the nose is a button battery. In the throat as well, to be fair, it'd be the same case because it erodes away. So that's the button battery is the really important thing that you want to remove immediately, no matter what you like. Take them to the ear straight away. Don't leave it and wait because it will erode through and cause a lot of damage. And then inorganic materials, because they're not going to erode either. So this is a button battery that a child swallowed. So that'll need to, they'll need to go to the theatre straight away and get that taken out. Um, and then throw anything in the airway, basically. <clears throat> the history you're looking at, if it's the ear, something in the ear, you ask about if they've got any pain or discharge from their ear and any hearing loss, and you'll examine them with an otoscope. So you look in the ear and see if you can find what, what's going on there. For the nose, it's issues with breathing and discharge. So you use a head torch and then your thoracum speculum to have a look. And then if they've ingested foreign bodies, you want to clarify what the object is. So if it's sharp, so like fish bones or cooked, like cooked meat, which is like a soft thing. And if they've got difficulty swallowing. <clears throat> and interestingly, different bones have different levels of opacity um, when um, on radiographs. So there's a lot of like, like cod and haddock are really well seen. Um, on radiographs so you'll be able to see them on a lateral film but there are other more expensive fishes that, <laughs> that aren't visible so that's important to remember <clears throat> and then when you're looking in the throat your head torch and then the lax tongue depressor which is here tongue depressor and then you have flazable next end uh, nasal endoscope so that's what this is goes through the nose and looks in the larynx so this is the epiglottis this is the tongue this is the, the base of the tongue Here's your retinoids, these are your vocal cords. So you're just looking in there for anything. And you do a plain film radiograph of a lateral soft tissue neck. So that side on view of the neck, to see if you can see anything radio opaque. And you can do a chest as well, like we just saw. Um, can anyone tell me 
why mediastinal widening is a red flag on a chest x-ray. Nothing in the chat just yet. No. Should we? Well, oh, wait, yeah, there is. Um, wait, a pneumomediastinum. Yeah, exactly. So you've either you perforated somewhere, you perforate your esophagus or your trachea, usually your esophagus, because the epiglottis will stop stuff going into the trachea. Um, and it's perforated. So you're now getting air and food into your mediastinum, which is a closed box. So if that widens with air or substances like fluid or food that's really worrying um, and if you're still highly suspicious but there's nothing shown on imaging you can get a ct neck because they're really sensitive so nearly 100 percent sensitivity <clears throat> so in the ears you can suction and um, you can pull out with forceps and um, you have these little probes that you can scoop things out for like insects and whatever and then you've got um them like wax probes as well where you can sort of like scoop um an important thing is if you've got live insects in someone's ear they need to be um you drain them in olive oil so because you don't want them to when you take them out because the stories of people taking like like flies and moths out of people's ears and they just start flying around the room which isn't um <laughs> isn't ideal i do feel bad for the insects though to be fair and then the throat so miguel's forceps if you can just get in there and pull it out and then this is a coin their child swallowed so this is on an endoscope and you can use these things like um, a grasper to pull it out red flags for foreign bodies so if they've got any airway compromise so stride or dysphonia so like difficulty speaking or drooling any signs of esophageal perforation so that's what we we're just talking about the mediastinum widening or chest pain or surgical emphysema and any history of button battery ingestion so request senior help straight away if any of the above present so now we've just got a few questions i think there's either seven or eight so a four-year-old is brought into the GP by a mother. Um, she's been distressed with ear pain for the past 14 hours. She's constantly touching and pulling at her ear um, while she's sat in the waiting room. Her mother notices a discharge of foul-smelling fluid from the ear, following which the pain resolves. What's the most likely diagnosis? So vestibular schwannoma, autosclerosis, preauricular sinus, acute suprotitis media, cholesteatoma, long-standing perforation of the pars tensor, or otitis externa. <clears throat> what are we thinking? I'll give people a few seconds to like think about it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so a titus media, acute superative a titus mm. media. Yeah, good. media with perforation. Okay. So yeah, so the yeah the salient points here, uh, she's now got discharge, foul smelling fluid, and then the pain's gone away. So that to me sounds like there was a bulging tympanic membrane. So he's sending pain via the nerves, um, which is then ruptured. So now you don't have that bulge anymore. So you don't have that pressure sensation. So the pain's gone. So yeah, acute superative otitis media. So two, you see a 22 year old female in a &E with a relatively light nosebleed that started 20 minutes ago. This is the first episode she's encountered and she's otherwise well. Routine bedside obs are normal. Blood tests have been sent to the lab. Venous blood gas shows a HB of 131, so it's a little bit low. Um, she's yet to try any measure to stop the bleeding, so you advise conservative measures. So which one is the best conservative measure here? <clears throat> Any takers? Yeah, so the most common answer is C, mm -hmm. um, pinch the <clears throat> cartilaginous part of the nose yep. through the mouth. Yeah, mouth. exactly. Because you're breathing through the mouth because you don't want to end up sending any, you, obviously you can't, if you're, if you're covering the nose, you can't, you wouldn't be able to breathe through the nose anyway. But even if you were, you don't want to move and remove any clots that might be forming. So that's right. Number three, which of the following is not part of the Centaur criteria? So this is the criteria for ruling in a bacterial tonsillitis. P. 
people are saying C again. Mm. Yep. So attend rapidly. That's not one of them. Good. Number four, <clears throat> which of the following is a non-superative complication of group A beta hemolytic strep tonsillitis? So people are saying a acute glomerulus. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> so we didn't we didn't get talk about this, but we did talk about some of the superative causes. So they're the things that produce pus. So quinsy, sinusitis, the tightest media, the non-superative are acute rheumatic fever and um, glomerulonephritis. So that's the post-strep glomerulonephritis. That's the one they normally present two weeks after a viral illness, although it's not viral, but two weeks after sort of like a sore throat with this like they might be weeing blood and whatnot so they've got a, a nephritic syndrome this is a long-winded one i apologize but um <clears throat> i'll give you the picture a five-year-old boy presents to the gp with a five-day history of fever um, and ear pain he's been unwell for several days with fever irritability and cough he was originally seen in an urgent care center who diagnosed him with acute otitis media and he was told to take paracetamol and ibuprofen as necessary um, despite these measures, symptoms continued, and this morning he vomited several times. His father is very concerned. He's not managed any oral intake over the last 12 hours, and he's no significant past medical history. He doesn't take any reg reg meds. Um, he met all of his developmental milestones, and he attends reception classes at local primary school. On examination, the left tympanic membrane appears inflamed and bulging, and the GP notices mild displacement of the left ear, and palpation behind the ear elicits pain and crying. What is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, everyone's saying D, mastoiditis. Yeah, acute mastoiditis. Smashing it. I think this is the penultimate question. So, three year old child presents with unilateral nasal discharge. I might be the last one for two days. What is your most likely differential? A septal perforation, a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, a foreign body, rhinitis, trauma from nose picking. <clears throat> See a foreign body. Yeah, in a child this young, you wouldn't be worried about any type of malignancy. Rhinitis would usually be bilateral. You don't really get this with a septal perforation and trauma from nose picking will probably produce blood as opposed to discharge. This, this is the last one. What is the most common cause of strider in children? So this is a, an acute strider. Laryngomalacia, croup, epiglottitis, bacterial tracheitis or anaphylaxis. Everyone's saying B, crew. Oh, smashing it. Yeah, croup is right. And then in, if it was chronic, laryngomalacia is most common in infants. So that's when you get your epi, epiglottis is like in the omega shape when you look at it from above and that collapses when you inspire. Okay, that's everything. Um, if anyone wants to write my email down, if you want to send me an email or ask any further questions, if there's not time here, then 